And now for our fireside chat, I'd like to introduce uh, Gary Marcus. Um, first, Gary Marcus is a professor at NYU. He uh, got his degree from that other Institute of Technology on the other coast, um, working with uh, Steve Pinker. So um, um, Gary has published a lot. In fact, he recently had a, had a nature paper comparing language in, um, in babies and in, uh, in, in uh, songbirds, in songbirds, animal model of that. And uh, he's, written, um, he's written several books, four books, one of which was the New York Times bestseller, Guitar Zero, also a, a great book called Cl uh, Cludge. And right now he's in fact editing a book on the future of the brain where, where, where there are several chapters written by, by in fact there's by one you. chapter <laughs> written by us uh, and together. Um, he also f uh, blogs frequently for the, for the New Yorker, particularly on topics of AI and on uh, neuroscience. Uh, welcome, Gary. Thank you very much. And Gary is going to have a, a dinner side chat. Uh, I think they're bringing in a fireplace later, the fireside chat, uh, with, uh, with Paul. Um, so officially, wel um, welcome, Paul, to the. Uh so I think, um, given where we are, I think instead of having a fireplace, we should actually set fire to one of Jimi Hendrix's guitars. <laughs> That'll keep us warm. So uh, first I want to say happy 10th uh, anniversary to everybody at the Allen Brain Institute. I think we should give a warm hand to everybody, including, of course, Paul. <laughs> a lot of people in this room were actually at almost the very beginning of the Allen Brain Institute. A bunch of people have referred to the charrette. Not everybody knows what that is. In a minute, I'll ask you about that. But before there was the birthday of, of the zeroth birthday of this creature that is the Allen Brain Institute, there was a gleam in your eye. Um, and not everybody was there for that. It was just you, I guess, that first thought, I'm going to do something. What is it that you first conceived of and why? <clears throat> well, I, I always had a, uh, I, I'm not sure hankering is the right uh, word, but I'd always had an, a desire to, to eventually uh, start to know more about neuroscience. And then I wondered, well, could I make a difference in the field of neuroscience um, you know, once I had substantial resources to potentially uh, apply? And, and, uh, and the challenge was to find a problem or a set of problems as a way into doing that. Um, so uh, after some discussion with Jim Watson and others, we, we convened this charrette. Um, you know, in it was a fairly uh, wonderful environment uh, on a boat um, in the Bahamas. Uh, and I <laughs> don't want to apologize too much for that, but it was very nice. But uh, the, the surprising thing, well, I mean, there are a number of things that were talked about. Uh, um, one was, you know, wow, Paul, you could, you could build a wonderful um, <clears throat> building and you could have all the scientists together, and, and then I would ask, a, you know, what I thought was a fairly um, almost idiotic question. Well, so all the scientists in the building are going to work together, and then they'd say, no, 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 they're, they're going to be collaborating with some guy in Kyoto, but it's nice to have them all together and they can exchange ideas. And that, that didn't resonate with me so much at that point. Uh, and the other idea was this idea of uh, that, that it was kind of uh, just crying, to be done, crying out to be done, which was to create a... Uh, genetic map of the uh, mouse brain, um, you know, with high standards for, for data and then put that data online, uh, have the data be open and be shared around the world. And it, it, uh, the minute it kind of surfaced, everybody was look, kind of looking at each other going, yeah, that would be great because it would save scientists around the world from, uh, I, I kind of look at science, scientists and what they do is drilling into uh, an orange and please feel uh, free to contradict me, but every scientist is, is working on a particular problem he's fascinated by with his, with his team, and they're all trying to get to the, the center or the core of the knowledge, but, they, but as they drill into the orange with their needles of investigation, uh, you know, it's painstaking, it takes a long time, you don't know when the breakthrough's gonna occur, but, but if you could create a, a database, like this genetic database of the mouse brain, that would give everybody uh, in neuroscience that was using the mouse, uh, mouse genetics anywhere in their model a head start. So all of these needles could, could start further into the orange as they penetrated in with their research. So, so as soon as that emerged, we started to get some critical mass around the idea. 
Um, fortunately, you know, we were able to, uh, not, not that far down the road, uh, Alan emerged as the, as the leader of the effort, and uh, things have just uh, gone amazingly well since then. Did, did you perceive from the beginning that one of the special things you could do was to take this big science approach that individuals couldn't do? I mean, did you think of that even before you brought these people together, or the instant that it, you heard it, it was like, yeah, this is something I can do that other people won't be able to do? No, it, it had an instant appeal because, uh, you know, it is, it's, you know, I, because, you know, my, my background is, is software engineering, I came, uh, you know, I had, had a company with Bill Gates before Microsoft, but eventually, you know, we did Microsoft together. It was that industrial approach where you had a team of people very focused with milestones and deliverables, and uh, there are only uh, a few examples of that being done in, in science before. Well, one, obviously, signature one was the Human Genome Project that, that Jim, uh, Jim uh, was involved in, uh, those so, uh, and, and, other, and other people here. So, so there were examples of that kind of, and that, that, of that kind of science being done in industrial engineering, just crank out that data in, in, in huge chunks, put it online. That, so that did a, appeal to my, you know, coming from an engineering, uh, industrial kind of software engineering background uh, immediately. On the other hand, the other signature aspect is not something that came from Microsoft, which is the open source. So you came from a proprietary company, and one of the biggest contributions of, of your institute is clearly that you make it the data available for everybody. Was that an immediate part of the plan? Did that come later? How did you get to that part of it? I think, I think it was a component of discussions early, and then we had, I mean, basically, you, all of these things, you want them to continue to be self-propagating, self-funding into the future. So there was some discussions about do we keep, you know, do we keep some of this data proprietary and then, uh, you know, that, that argument was quickly over, overcome by the idea of trying to, you know, lift all boats, all scientific boats around the world um, was, so, was so much more compelling and important. Was that, that coming partly from the Genome Project, which I guess was starting to... Well, that, in clearly, biology, push that, that clearly was an exemplar of that that kind of an approach. So, uh, and you know, I, I don't have I have zero regrets, mm -hmm. and that's and that's become part of our um, our modus operandi is to is to do everything, uh, you know, and all the data, you know, to provide all the data in that way and provide great tools for slicing and dicing the data and having different views of it. So all day we've been looking at that chart. I think it's still there. Um, I guess you put in, if I do my math right, about 200 million first, and then you re-opt for another 300 million. Is that it? Um, <laughs> I think that's all. Um, you, have, you have a line in your book about uh, losing $8 billion, so I guess you know, it's all, all relative. You're the only person I know who could have a sentence like, um, to have lost $8 billion, and then you go on to the happiness in the next chapter. Um, well, I'm not <laughs> proud of it, but... Uh. Well, that did actually bring me to one of my other questions, which is, in that book, you talk a lot about what you learned. Um, I want to come back to the re-upping, but you, you talked a lot about your failures as well as your successes. You were much more candid in your book, I think, about not only what you lost, but how you lost it, how much you lost. People would say, I had you know, a bad time in the cable industry, but you, would, you, know, you spelled out in great detail what happened, and you made the observation that every time you have one of these failures, you, lose, you, sorry, you learn something from it. Did any of those failures drive the, the early days here and how you thought about organizing it? Uh, I'm not, I mean, the cable business is, is not that specific. thankfully doesn't have many, uh, the way it works, as few analogs <laughs> to how science is done. Um, it's a very, uh, except, you know, science can be slow moving at times and the cable business is definitely not one of, it's, it's not as fast, if you talk about the speed of which things move, uh, you know, you've got the personal computer, and now you've got you know consumer electronics, which moves super fast. In science, there's a lot of, I guess, periods of gathering data, developing new techniques, and then you try to, you know, figure out how do you foment breakthroughs based on having all these new weapons. Uh, is it is it are, are there processes like industrial science that can help accelerate that? Um, and you try to and you try to figure out how do you set the table. For breakthroughs, that's what we're that's what we're uh, engaged in and going down the path nowadays. But uh, you know, m many of these things, uh, you know, turn out to be people questions. Who who is your, you know, who's the leadership of your cable company? 
Who's the leadership of your financial team? Are they some of the best uh, in the business? And I'm very confident with, you know, with, with Alan and Christoph and Claire Reed, so many others. We've got such a great team at Ames now that uh, it, that's, that's not a concern. But in the past, you know, you can, you're only as good as the, the people that are executing the mission that they've undertaken. So what are you proud of, most proud of in the first decade? Well, I think that, you know, the data, I mean, we, our initial goal was to do the genetic genetics of the, of the mouse brain. That, at the time, that was uh, somewhat controversial. Um, it's hard now, in retrospect, to see exactly why, because it's, I think it's been accepted as a, a, just the basis of so much research. Somebody mentioned to me today that most papers that they see, there's some thread back, uh, like on the on mouse-related papers, uh, or, human, or papers that involve mouse genetics or human genetics, there's some thread back, probably in two thirds of the papers, to, uh, that may be high, to you know, some, uh, some database that was done. And that's, that's just so uh, rewarding to think that's, that's the case. But now you know, we're, we're biting off some, uh, some really amazing challenges in trying to understand function. And I think you know, if, there's, if, if, if I, you know, I was in the audience for, for most of today's talks, if there's if there's you know some things to take away from today, it's it's the immense complexity that you're dealing with, uh, you know, in neuroscience, neuroscience or genetics. All of these things are hideously complex. So teasing them apart and fig and figuring out how, as an organization, you try to you know reverse engineer uh, you know com fairly completely a system like the mouse visual system. That is a massive, ambitious undertaking, but it's one we're very excited about pursuing. So, so how do you think about that? I mean, you, you cut your teeth building BASIC in four kilobytes. That was easy. That, that was easy, eh? Um, of course, it helped to have Bill Gates you know, running a lot of the code. But. <laughs> so that's part of your answer to the question I'm about to ask. How are you going to manage with the, the terabytes or petabytes that are, are going to come forth? How, 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 do, how should we, as a field, think about that question of how to manage all of this? Well, I mean, you keep, I don't know how many, uh, you know, two or three years from now, how many terabytes of data we're going to, or petabytes of data we're going to produce a month, but it's going to be a huge amount of data as we, as we instrument, you know, the mouse visual system and put that data up um, online. It's going to be a huge amount of data. So the challenge becomes, okay, you've got this huge amount of data, and how do you develop a virtuous circle or cycle so that you, you're developing some data and then you're measuring it in a certain way and some of that informs a model and then you tweak the model to reflect how you think the data should be being generated and then you look at the data and you say, well, wait a minute, no, my model's not right, I gotta go back and change it and then I gotta improve my probes and all those different things. So that is, that is the big challenge and, and, but our data will be you know, available so anybody in the world can will collaborate. We'll work with you know many people to try to try to tease out these fundamental principles, which are so uh, so mysterious, and you're just craving understanding these things. Like when you looked at you looked at uh, Lloyd's model of the uh, auditory system. Now you know that I don't know uh, what you'd say, but it's it's an approximation. I mean that's. It's an approximation. I think what, what I understood Lloyd to be saying was you're trying to come up with some algorithms that approximate what, what the human auditory system does, but there's probably some other tricks going on under the hood that we haven't reverse engineered yet. But, it's, but, but just imagine, not just the auditory system, and that's, and that's just part of the auditory system, but even be able to do it to some degree has great benefits you know, in, in smartphones. But imagine if you're trying to do something like understanding Language. I mean, that's that's many many decades. Of, I don't know what people would say, but that's many many decades of work. But to start really moving down that path, uh, it's exciting days. What do you think about the clinical implications? How long do you think it'll be before the kinds of things that happen here make a major impact in in treatment? Well, I think uh, you can start from the from the talks today. I think you can start to see the through lines that start to link you know, the genetic to the phenotypes to the pathologies. Now, the, the other problem that we need to, to bear down on is to get inside cells and understand the pathways inside cells and how they're being permuted in, in disease states uh, in their very intricate ways. Now, 
So, so some of our databases can, can help with that and can, can show what's happening at a functional level so you can start to understand how it might go wrong in disease. But, getting, but I'm also fascinated and we're starting to talk about how do you get in and really understand cell biology with the same kind of industrial uh, approach. Um, so that's, that's another holy grail. If you think about what are the toughest problems out there to solve uh, and can you impact them, I mean, it, there's obviously neuroscience, cell biology, artificial intelligence, global warming, you know, there's a bunch of them. But then they're all super hard for different reasons. It could be scale, it could be just the end, but the biological ones are just, I mean, just, I mean, I was asking somebody today, how many uh, papers are published in neuroscience in a year? And I think the answer was, was it 600,000 somebody, somebody mentioned? I don't know, it's a lot. So that's, I don't know how big the stack is, but it's a very high stack of papers, and that's just one, one year's worth, but how many new real revolutionary principles came out of that? I, I always ask that question. Every one of our meetings, I say, so what's revolutionary this month? And everybody goes, nah, not sure. So, so we're, we want to come up with some of those, some of those things. That's what, uh, or at least glimpse them, or start to glimpse them, or try to help other people uh, discover them. So that's what's so fascinating and compelling. The, these huge, compelling mysteries that are just out, just, it starts it's starting to feel like they're just outside of our grasp. Now, of course, you want to take some of that knowledge, uh, you know, and, and, and come up with, bring forward and make earlier treatments for, for different disease. And, uh, you know, my, my mother died of, of Alzheimer's, so uh, I certainly want that to be the case. But we're, at this point, we're more involved in the pure science of understanding how the brain works. Um, but we hope that the genetic, as in our next step, we hope the genetic databases that we've done so far are helping with uh, solving and starting to move forward on some of these disease solutions. Did I hear a bare hint of the gleam of an idea for an Allen Cell Biology Institute? Yeah, he did. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Possibly many of us heard it here first. Um, uh, I won't push on that right now unless you want to say more about it. But. Um, not everybody in this room will know that you just also announced a new AI institute. Would you like <coughs> to talk about that a little bit? Well, <coughs> or maybe institutes putting words in your mouth, but a new initiative in AI. Yeah, it's it's a it's a it's a well, artificial intelligence is notorious for its uh, uh, you know fits and its own fits and starts. And recently, there's been. You know the the Watson project that IBM had uh, that that one Jeopardy one at Jeopardy uh, is is held you know all of these things are held up as examples of you know breakthroughs and they are they are progress but to try to for example the pro the problem that I wanted to to try to and I am wanting people to try to solve at at AI two or AI squared is is trying to encode the knowledge. Uh, of a portion of a biology textbook so that people can ask questions, they can get lessons, so, f so forth. That is an extremely hard problem because people don't, you know, well, I think people in this room will realize more than others, but when you start talking about, the minute you start talking about anything involving language and knowledge representation and, and, and listening to, to spoken, you know, words, a sentence or something, that is invoking all of the brain's language abilities, history, and, and you know, internal dictionaries, and and the meanings of things, and uh, it's it's it, it, it invokes a huge part of your brain to understand, you know, just you know, just uh, the evening news, or or much less a biology textbook, which is, you know, you start talking about a cell membrane, well, just describing logically to a computer what a cell membrane really is, is that's, you can't even do it with pages. Nobody knows exactly how to represent it optimally in a, in a piece of software, just to give you an example. So you can kind of do something, but not anything that's complete. So you end up with something that, well, Paul, we encoded, the researchers are coming in and saying, well, Paul, we encoded 40% uh, of this, this chapter of biology, uh, but then you start looking at it, and the and the the expression of what a membrane is 
is not what exists in the human mind to, to represent a membrane. So that's a whole green field of further research. So I'm, you know, I'm very excited that Orin Etzioni from the University of Washington has joined us to, to head up that effort. And, uh, and uh, I'm optimistic we can make some progress. They're using an approach that is, is, is in somewhat analogous to the things we talked about today, where it's not any one, uh, it's not any one algorithm, it's a bunch of cooperating algorithms that together uh, have a power that that's 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 uh, that goes that goes far beyond what's done, been done before. But it's it's very that's also very ambitious. Time Sorry, that was a long answer. Timeline question for you. I happen to notice uh, in one of the breaks today that in in the museum here you have Commander Data's uh, uniform. So how far are we from from having an Android I'd brain on that I'd like to ask that, that guy part? some questions. He, he, he has some <laughs> answers. I'm sorry. How far away do you think we are from from human level AI? I mean, you, you've had a bit of an argument with Ray Kurzweil about that. Well, I I, I have uh, I guess a, a strong allergy to these arguments that you know progress is is just based on some exponential curves. You know, no progress is based on somebody having a blinding flash of insight after they looked at a bunch of data, and then they have a realization, they, and they connect the dots. And you can't just plunk down on a, on a graph when those flashes of insight uh, occur. So imagine, take, the, take the brain. Is it, is it 20 Nobel Prizes, 100 Nobel Prizes, 500 Nobel Prizes before we understand really how the brain uh, works to, as well as uh, data's brain did uh, in the TV show, where he's really an actor? Playing, playing, a, playing an Android. Uh, it, we're so far away. We're so far away from that level uh, of understanding. But these are the big. The thing that gets me excited. These are the big questions. These are the. We'd all love to know how. Do, you know how could you, uh, you know, understand language or create, you know, some kind of entity that was actually conscious. I mean, those are the. Those are the most fascinating questions. We, we, we all love to be working on those questions. So I, so, uh, I love to be on the periphery of these things and, and try to set the table and try to talk about, OK, there's the landscape of all possible neuroscience problems. OK, which do we go over here? Do we go over here? What do you think? And then and try, to do, try to facilitate those discussions. We, working on those problems, love that you're supporting these things. I think the kinds of challenges that you're supporting are things that governments don't always do because I think they're often focused on what's the immediate thing that we can do tomorrow and you're going after some of the big questions that, that are not easily answerable in somebody's next uh, grant proposal. So I think it's really exciting what you're doing. What's also really exciting is probably most of you have never had a chance to ask Paul Allen a question. Not all of you will, but at least a couple of you will. We have time for, I don't know, two or three questions. I don't, I don't see who the clock is, but does anybody, would anybody like to ask Paul a question? Um, do we have someone running microphones? Um, Joe over here is, is one person that I know. Maybe we can. Or, over. You don't need one. You, you can go first and then we'll. Go. Great. I speak loudly too, but the mic's helpful. Um, I'm curious how you see the different institutes working together. So, with Project Halo, right now it might not be at the point where it's useful for what happens at AIBS. But maybe five years down the line, where do you see that happening, or that intersection occurring? Well, I'd love to be able to say that uh, if somebody told me that there was a diagram of you know, how the language organ in the brain worked that was equivalent to Lloyd's example of the human auditory system, we could just start there. Unfortunately, I'm not aware of anything that has any, any analog to that. So, so basically, what you try to do is use, you know, introspection and linguistics and try to intuit what needs to exist and then try th and try things and that's what that's what AI has, has has undertaken these many years and it's made some progress uh, but it's you know it's it's in a way it's 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 a strange kind of race between can you create an artificial uh, um, you know object or entity or something that can that can perform at language before you understand how it's done in the brain. It's a kind of crazy race, and I don't know which, you know, I don't know which horse to bet on. I'm betting on both. I, 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 both are fascinating. Trying to do both, are, they're both fascinating questions. Just real quick, is it possible to leverage the technology out of AI to help the understanding of the brain? Uh, 
I think that there are, we, we've talked about that in the past, and we've tried a few very modest things in terms of you're representing knowledge in such a way, uh, you know, in such a way, or representing papers about different things. And one of the things that, that there's such an avalanche, if you imagine the avalanche, I was talking about the avalanche of published papers in neuroscience, and if you could somehow have a taxonomy of things, and you might, there might be something that's distantly related but could really bear on what you're working on. Maybe some piece of AI-enabled software could help you find that thing, even though you, it might not be on your radar. Because we are drowning in a sea of data and publications and everything else. So maybe there's some AI techniques that could help with that problem. I guess I'll go without a microphone. Oh, we'll get you a mic. Here. Hang on one sec. Live mic, that might be too much to ask. Hello? Yeah. Can, um, so uh, last year we had a conference in Aspen of cracking the neural code, and Alan Jones and Christoph were part of that conference. And the first panel that we had was on large neuroscience projects, like what you're doing and the Human Brain Project in Europe. You and I had dinner, I think, in 2009, and I mentioned that the model that you've created here is something that I think has to be replicated to avoid redundancy and, uh, and waste of research dollars because you're creating all of this data that can be shared in an open fashion. I wonder if anyone in the organization is creating sort of an arm's length template of the Allen Institute uh, style or structure of developing this so that it can be shared uh, with other people and other organizations around the world because I think this is just incredible uh, model and Well, thank you. I mean, it's, it's, we're, we're happy to share, uh, you know, but our, to the degree we have special sauce, uh, what it is, but it's, <laughs> but it's, uh, it's, it's really, um, uh, it is timeline driven, industrial, collaborative, team based science that is, is different from the, the academic model that, 99.9% .9 of the way science is done. And so I hope there will be uh, you know, other, model or other organizations that, that take up our model and, and run with it. That would be fantastic. Thank you. Thank you for what you've done. Other questions? For a couple more? Any other questions? The, the, uh, Can we bring that, other, that mic around, I guess? It would be a long way around. Well, the, the problem is it, it's, we don't know what, it's like, you know, do you need a faster computer to run a piece of code that hasn't been written? Now, it's, I think it's more important to try to, you know, if you had code that understood language, but it understood it very slowly, people would be running it now. We don't have that piece of code. So I, I'm not so worried about, and, and God knows that the chip guys at, at, at Intel and, and other companies and NVIDIA and everything, they're, they're coming up with faster processors all the time. So I, know, I don't really worry about Moore's Law and having processors that are fast enough. The problem is, what is that piece of code that's simulating anything, whether it's a cortical column or language understanding or anything else? Does it, how close does it really work to nature's amazingly functional uh, gray matter? I mean, that's, that's the question. And so when you look at something like you know, the European work, uh, it's, interesting to st it's going to be interesting to see, is there a virtuous cycle there so that their models, as they become more elaborate and more precise, and do they re are they really mimicking what's happening in a cortical column? And you know, our data will, will help, you know, help inform their, their research, too. So, so I'm not, I don't worry about you know, computational resources. That, that's, that's not the problem. The problem is the algorithms themselves. As a biographical note, the person that you asked this question for um, partly made his name by writing uh, assembly language code for a computer that didn't yet exist. So he has a long history of knowing you can <laughs> write things in simulation and get the hardware later and still make it nice. all work. Nice, nice. The next, next question over here. 
Hi. Um, I find emerging technologies really humbling, and I find the idea of working in it, um, you know, maybe something that I might not necessarily benefit from, that the future, future generations might. But the, the, the idea that, is there, do you have any ideas on how we can encourage more funds and more people to, to put their time and their, and their money into these kind of areas when, you know, they might not see those kind of short-term benefits uh, or, um, you know, immediate financial returns? Well, I, I think that, that kind of opens up the question of how much, uh, what can you do to give more uh, impetus to pure research? I mean, the, we all benefit from things like the ARPANET, which became the Internet, were, were done, um, you know, basically funded by the Defense Department as pure research at one point, and I became aware of it in the, you know, I guess this shows my age back in the in the '60s. So, so, but now we all we're all using the internet all the time. So, how do you how do you can how do you get government um, or or philanthropic institutions to pivot so they spend more on pure research? Um, that's a great that's a great question, and I think it has a lot to do with getting getting the message out and try, and showing the long, the downstream benefits. Uh, the downstream benefits from any any of these things, and saying we should dedicate a, you know some portion of everything we're doing to this. I, I just personally feel like you know, I I've, you know, I think we've all seen the benefits of pure research, and I personally feel a call to want to do this kind of pure research in different domains and try to attack these mysterious, wonderful, incredibly hard. Problems. How do you how do you get in there and try to solve them? But 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 you but you know knowing uh, that it's going to be decades uh, you know down the road before you may see you know uh, true true impact. I mean I I'm, I look I'm looking forward to the day that somebody somebody sends me an email saying okay there's a new drug that's been discovered to, to treat this because of something that was done done at Aves. I think there there may already be such a such a thing, but uh, that's uh, that's th that's the kind of patience you have to have because uh, there are decades and decades of work. I remember I went into uh, Dr. Eric Kandel, um, a famous uh, memory researcher. I went into his office full of enthusiasm. This is probably eight years ago, and I said, "Dr. Kandel, we're, we're starting this brain institute, and I want your advice. And you know, we're going to make so much progress in the next ten years." It's not easy. He said, "Stop, stop, Mr. Allen." Not in my lifetime and not in your lifetime are we going to understand fully how the brain works. I mean, the scope of the problem is so huge and so intricate, but you've got to attack it and start making progress. And so uh, I'm very excited to be, um, you know, dedicating a, you know, a, big, a big amount of my resources to trying to, to move that forward with an, ama an amazing team of people. I'd like to... I'd like to thank Alan and everybody else from the Kristoff, everybody else from the from the Brain Institute for the new